we are at the top of the hour. So good morning, good afternoon, maybe for some of you, good evening. I'm Lisa Infelice. I'm ASCPT Senior Director of Membership. I want to thank you all for joining us for this special presentation today being brought to you by Sertara. Prior to handing things over to our moderator, I just want to mention a few quick housekeeping items. As an attendee, your microphone does stay muted throughout the presentation. Please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation. Uh, if you don't see the Q&A button, you might need to hover to the bottom of your screen to get it to populate. Uh, the, we will be recording today's presentation. It will be posted to our open access webinar library in the very near future, as well as on Sertara's website. If you have questions, comments, things you wish you would have addressed today but did not following the webinar, please go ahead and submit them to members at ASCPT.org. At this time, I'll hand things over to Suzanne to kick us off. Hi, right, thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you so much to AS ASCPT for allowing us to do this presentation. I'd like to welcome and introduce my colleague, Dr. Mark Lovern. He's a senior vice president at IDD, the integrated drug development at Sertara, where we are accelerating medicines using biosimulation software and technology to transform traditional drug discovery and development. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to speak with everyone, with, well, you and everyone today. Yeah, it's, it's always great to talk to you. Um, just have a couple questions for you. Um, we've known each other for a long time and I, I remember you telling me about your, that you, you grew up in rural Oregon. Can you tell us what that was like? Pretty rustic actually. Uh, the sole source of heat in the house I grew up in was wood, uh, a wood stove. Uh, and generally speaking, most mornings it was my job to start the fire and get the house warm. Uh, the downtown area where I grew up uh, really was a, a one building or one main building in the garage. The, the main building was a country store, gas station and post office. Uh, and the, the guy that owned the store was also the postmaster. And then the outbuilding was actually a garage where they kept a fire truck. And that same individual was also the volunteer fire chief. So very small town uh, in, in uh, rural Oregon where timber industry was really the, the predominant source of income. Yeah, wow, cool. And, and uh, after you left Oregon, you, you pursued your educational training that led you to where you are now. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I was always an interdisciplinarian, I guess you'd say. My undergraduate degree was uh, environmental science. I got to do so many cool things uh, in my undergraduate, everything from uh, digital imagery, uh, satellite imagery processing to geology, ecology, Etc. But in the course of my undergraduate, I took a career. I took one of these. Uh, one of my favorite courses was called Physical and Environmental Systems, which was a mathematical modeling course, but with a environmental spin. And that was sort of my segue into my graduate career, which was also interdisciplinary. And that was uh, a biomathematics program at NC State, uh, which essentially. Uh, was a wholly owned subsidiary of the statistics department at that point. And my dissertation research was really in toxicology, which was sort of my segue into the pharma uh, milieu, as it were. Right. And um, yeah, I think interdisciplinary skills are always great. You know, you never quite know what skills you'll you'll draw on. So after you, you finished your education, you, you started your career in pharma. Can you tell us what that journey looked like? Sure. My first job out of graduate school was with a company called Quintiles, which has since become IQVIA. I was hired by a guy named Dan Weiner, who some may have heard of as uh, one of the co-authors of the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data analysis uh, text. And uh, about the first week I had joined, Dan left to join a company called Farsight, uh, which is actually one of the progenitor companies of Sotara. Uh, a year or so after that, I was invited to join uh, Farsight in a software support capacity. And I spent about five years there uh, supporting the software, learning about PopPK and PKPD modeling, eventually transitioning into the, the consultancy group. And then after about five years, I launched out into pharma uh, to get some bona fide drug development experience. I was out there. Uh, in G at GSK and UCB for about five years. 
when uh, I was contacted by some ex-Farsight colleagues that were at a company called Quantitative Solutions uh, for an opportunity uh, with their consultancy firm as they were just opening an East Coast office. And so I worked for them for about four years or so when our, our whole company uh, eventually was purchased by Satara. So in many ways, I've almost come full circle as one of my first jobs was with Farsight, uh, but, and then eventually got bought by its progeny company, uh, Satara. Yeah, and I know I know that um, I've been at Sertara since 2013, and in the eight years I've been here, you know, we've talked about this before. I've seen so much change. Can you tell us how you think Sertara has changed since your first stint with Farsight in 1999? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, um, I think you know, Farsight was really known first and foremost as a modeling and simulation company. The focus was, uh, you know, one of the things that claimed to fame was uh, clinical trial simulation and applying, you know, models uh, to answering uh, drug development questions. That spirit is very much alive at Sotara, but Sotara is more of what I would consider to be a model informed drug development company. And modeling and simulation plays a part in that and a central part in the, all of that. But there's much more to model informed drug development than sort of population PK or PKPD modeling, or uh, you know even pharmacometrics as a whole. There's quantitative clinical pharmacology. There's also weighing into consideration when making a drug development decisions, uh, economic aspects, which we actually have a, a group that focuses specifically on. Uh, value and access and looking at those economic aspects of the um, decision making. And of course, uh, there are other aspects such as the regulatory strategy. So it's really, a more, I would say, a more comprehensive approach to model informed drug development of which the pharmacometric aspects play a very you know, important part. Right. So speaking of, of pharmacometrics, we have a lot of really great colleagues that are also clinical pharmacologists. Can you talk a little bit about how pharmacometricians work with clinical pharmacologists at Sertara? Sure, I, I would be happy to. I'm just gonna share something as an example uh, to sort of illustrate this. Um, this was, uh, th what you're seeing here is our pharmacometric project roadmap, which is a the culmination of an exercise that we did a few years ago where we, looked at all of our analysis and reporting uh, processes for pharmacometric reports and uh, built into this process. Mark, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, you might wanna, I don't think it's sharing quite yet. Oh, you know what? Yeah. Maybe I'm sharing, thank you so much. Oh, all good. Is it sharing now? No? Okay, let's try this again. Oh, you know what? I there you go. Click yep. a I forgot to click a button. Yep, all good. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Yep. So uh, as I was mentioning, this, this process map here represents the culmination of us first looking at how we were historically doing pharmacometric analysis and reporting, and then looking at how we can improve that process with the understanding that we have colleagues, clinical pharmacology colleagues that we work with whom we work hand in glove. And so uh, when you look at this process map, each color represents a role in each of these pie charts. And you can see there's a lot of red, which is the pharmacometric project lead. But there's also a lot of places where yellow, being our clinical pharmacology colleagues, come in uh, you know, to, to play. And uh, as an example, if I click any of these pie charts, what I get is a longitudinal process map. And for instance, if I'm drafting an analysis plan, you can see that there are certain key checkpoints where we invite or, or, or actually require our clinical pharmacology colleagues to really weigh in. And one of the things that's most important uh, is to really make sure that whatever we're doing is in line with the development strategy for the, uh, the, the compound of, or the project. Uh, and that is, I think, very important because I think sometimes as modelers or analysts, we get 
really caught up in the, the mechanics of analyzing the data and sometimes lose sight of the forest for the trees. And so having that higher level, more strategic perspective as to how that analysis is gonna impact the decision-making in the, the program, I think is really important. Uh, there are other points throughout the entire process where we consult with our quantitative clinical pharmacology colleagues, because I think that's a really valuable uh, interaction that we have. Just as another aside, this process map that you're seeing here is also a gateway where, for instance, if I'm writing a analysis plan, I can uh, just click this little tooltip here and I get immediate access to the analysis plan template. So um, it's, a, it's, I think, a very uh, efficient way to help us execute on the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So now, trying to stop the share. I think it's the button at the bottom. Oh, there, yeah, there, there you go. There we go. I got it. Thank you. Yep. So um, now you've kind of shown you've shown us how people work together at Sertara. Can you tell us why you love working at Sertara? Sure. Well, I think that that that's a natural segue because I think that's one of the things that that's great about working at Sertara is that we're not just a pharmacometric company. We are a model informed drug development company. And that facilitates a lot of interaction and cross pollination between ourselves and clinical pharmacology. Uh, of course, we also have a software division where we develop tools that help us do what we do on a daily basis. And they regularly consult with us pharmacometricians in terms of how to better improve the product. So there's, there's a lot of really bright people here that that are interacting very collaboratively. Uh, and, and I think that leads to a lot of synergy. I think one of the other things that's really inspiring is the mission that this company has. I mean, really, we, we are all very dedicated to getting better medicines to patients sooner and and also candidly, potentially killing those bad compounds that are not really that promising or helping people do that so that those resources can be invested in, in you know, more promising therapies. And so I think those two things are really uh, great. I think another thing is just personally, if there's just so much flexibility here in terms of where you can work from, uh, when you can work, et cetera. I mean, I can work any from anywhere in the world as long as I've got a laptop and a high internet connection. And so that's also very much part of the Tara culture. Absolutely. And I would definitely agree. We've got great colleagues and uh, I would say we're, we're definitely a mission driven organization. So talking about skills that people who might want to work at Sertara would, would, would need, what skills do you think clinical pharma, phar pharmacologists and pharmacometricians need to be successful? Well, I mean, the technical know-how is, is, is a given. I, I mean, I think that's what, you know, clinical pharmacology uh, programs and pharmacometric programs are really geared toward is training people to be, you know, to really know the science. Having said that, I think a really crucial aspect that has an, uh, you know, a, is a big determiner of the impact that we have is the ability to communicate or influence. Uh, and by that, I mean that uh, particularly for pharmacometricians, I, I, I regard all pharmacometricians as consultants. And the reason for that is that by and large, we are not the decision makers in terms of making the big calls as to, for instance, what is the label dose end up being? for a drug or whether to kill a drug and invest in maybe the backup compound. These decisions are largely made uh, by other folks that are heads of clinical teams and, and probably are not coming from a background where they may even understand pharmacometrics and in some cases may be outrightly hostile to it. And in that sense, it's really paramount that if a pharmacometrician wants to have an influence on the decision making, they have to be really great communicators and influencers. And that is something that is really also very emphasized in our culture here. And I, as an illustration, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. And here we go. And I'll remember to hit the share button this time. How's that? <laughs> yep, looks great. Great. So another thing that we did in the past uh, few years is we have 
um, developed a, a, a training and development program for all of our uh, consultants within our integrated drug development consultancy group. And some of this is geared uh, to sort of just the overall career development strategy and, and making, and that's where this career path guide comes in. And it, I think it's a very nice guide as far as, you know, what sort of non-scientific skills are really expected at different uh, at different levels within our job ladder, so to speak. But one of the things I'm particularly proud of as well is these resources that we've made available uh, around the core consultancy skills. There's a lot, here's, and this, by, by the way, this is just version 1.0. We are actively working this year on sort of taking this to the next level. But as you can see, there are uh, these links here, which make available e-learning modules that people can take at their on-demand. Uh, and one of these big ones here is uh, communication, as well as uh, emotional intelligence, thought leadership. So these are all themes that of non-scientific skills that we feel are gonna be really crucial to our success as, a, as an organization. And they're all there for our team members to use uh, as they uh, have need or interest. Absolutely, and you and I have talked about our, our shared passion for scientific communication and, and helping people get better at it. So uh, just one last question for you, Mark. What advice would you give people that are early in their career? I, I think one of the things I would, uh, a couple of things, I would suggest that you be, and maybe they're the same thing or just a different way of saying them, the, one is stay curious and stay open-minded. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I think that throughout my career, I have sometimes been surprised by opportunities that maybe I thought I wasn't really ready for. Uh, an example of that was back in 2007, I was very happily ensconced uh, as a pharmacometrician at a major pharma company when I was approached by an executive search firm. Uh, for an opportunity in Belgium. And I was like, no, thanks. I'm really happy where I am. Uh, but one of my friends uh, gave me a great piece of advice. He was like, well, that's kind of narrow-minded. Well, why would you not at least hear what someone has to say? Even though you're happy where you are, that doesn't mean there's not something even better out there for you. Uh, and so I was like, you know, you're right. I think I'll take that interview. And so I did. Uh, and that led to me being in Brussels, Belgium for two years. And, and what a great experience that was. I was right uh, on one of the main city squares uh, with, uh, with you know, chocolatiers and good beer uh, within a stone's throw. And um, it was just a really amazing experience. And ever since, I've always been of the mind that uh, whenever someone calls me with an opportunity, I always at least take the call. And, uh, you know, if I decide that it's not something that I'm interested in, that's fine, too. But at least I've made an informed decision. And so that's um, that's one thing I would say. If you're starting out in your career, be open to possibilities. Absolutely. I think, Mark, I think that's awesome advice. And uh, Mark and I have talked a little bit about why what we do at Sertara and why we love it. But you don't have to take our word for, for it. I'm going to share a video where our colleagues talk about why they love working at Sertara and uh, hopefully this will show and play. Hi, I'm Kemi Taylor. I analyze clinical Oops, trial oops. data to help companies successfully develop their drugs. I really enjoy working at Sertara because I get to work on a variety of projects in different therapeutic areas. So I'm always learning. And I have the best colleagues with many different areas of expertise. Everyone is enthusiastic and excited about what we do. So Sertara is a really great place to work. Hi, my name is Fabian Rauscher. Uh -oh. Und ich arbeite mit unseren Kunden aus der pharmazeutischen Industrie daran, dass sie schneller und effektiver Zugriff auf ihre Forschungsdaten bekommen und es dadurch neue Therapien schneller auf dem Markt schaffen. An meiner Arbeit bei Zatara mag ich, dass ich mit tollen Kollegen zusammenarbeite und dass ich mir meine Arbeit flexibel und effektiv einteilen kann. 
Hi there, my name is Sabira Hashem. I create evidence used to accelerate therapeutics. Satara gives me the opportunity to challenge my intellect and strengthen my scientific knowledge. Hi there, I am Bergen Gardines. I provide project management support to ensure data integrity. A work environment where everyone feels comfortable and supports employee voice. Here, we have a collective of individuals regardless of diversity. Do you feel welcome and feel respected? Hi, David here. I build a graphical user interface for the various SimSip simulators. Why Satara? I like working with people who are passionate and dedicated. I like the products that do good. And I like playing five-a-side football with the office on Tuesday lunchtimes. Hey, heads up. Okay. So yeah. hopefully that, that played all right. Um, and uh, you can see why we why uh, we really have a ball working at Sertara, and uh, we hope that you ha are uh, convinced of that, and you come and uh, check out our careers page. I think Lisa has shared that in the chat, and um, check out the opportunities that we have at Sertara. Great. Okay. Well, um, Mark, it looks like we have got a couple questions from our audience. So uh, one of them is, um, does Sertara offer fellowships and internships? Uh, we uh, do offer some fellowships and that we're, we're continuing to develop that program. We have a few uh, that we've uh, recently, well, we had a cohort that we best uh, sponsored at Monash University. Uh, we are also sponsoring a, a few fellows at UNC Chapel Hill, but we are looking uh, in the, the next few years to expand that program to other universities as well. Awesome. And um, someone wants to know, um, we talked about the soft skills that you need as a pharmacometrician, but someone wants you to, to give a little bit of specific detail about skills and software that you think a, a beginner pharmacometrician would be uh, wise to invest in. Well, of course, there's our, our suite of analysis project products that it would be um, worthwhile. Uh, but in addition, I think R is a big one, um, and you know, and a lot of people still use non-mem. Uh, so I think I would recommend, uh, you know, R non-mem, and then the, the Satara suite of products would be a, a very good start. Awesome. And so we talked. We got some questions about early career. What about um, folks that are a little bit later in their career? Can you tell us about some consulting positions that might be of interest? So I. I here we have uh, quite a bit of flexibility in so, in so far as that um, you know we have a quantitative clinical pharmacology consultancy practice. So these are folks that are used uh, are practiced in the art of designing clinical development programs and mapping out, uh, for instance, clinical pharmacology studies that you're going to need for your portfolio. Uh, if Pharmacometrics is more your, your bag. There are many routes into the pharmacometrics uh, community. I, as I said, I, I did not come uh, into pharmacometrics trained classically, if you could call it that. I came with a quantitative background and then uh, some familiarity of the science and, and, a, and a fair amount of hands-on practice. So um, there are, uh, you know, again, the quantitative skills uh, uh, you know, applied to pharmacology. I think there's a lot of different ways there that you can um, sort of segue, if you will. Yeah. Someone asked a question about volunteering opportunities. It makes me think of, what was it? Uh, before the pandemic, we did the uh, the USO. Uh, we packed gift, gift boxes for the USO, right? Yeah, so we do, uh, we have done a, a, a couple different service uh, events. Uh, and one of those, like you said, was the USO. Uh, at one of our U.S. group leaders meetings for the quantitative sciences, we, we had a face-to-face. -face. It was right before the pandemic. And at our lunch break, we actually went, uh, all of us, to a women's shelter uh, here locally within Raleigh and, and volunteered to serve lunch for the, these women that, that are you know, at risk. And so I, I think that's a big part of our culture as well. And I think that especially when the pandemic eases up, there's going to be a lot more of that because I think that, um, you know, 
especially for when we're trying to build a team, I can't think personally of any better way to do it than, than through service, because I think that that, you know, doing something purposeful, I think always builds a bigger bond than, you know, potentially, you know, just enjoying or indulging, shall we say. Yeah. There is that aspect too, but you know. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I think service is great. And I, I know we have, you know, at uh, Sertara being a global organization, you know, some of our colleagues in different offices do different things. I know, um, I think our Synchrogenics colleagues in Delaware do uh, a lot of work with the local Ronald McDonald House. So yes, we do, we do support volunteering. Um, Mark, someone wants to know about uh, the work that we do in preclinical development. All right, now I will confess that preclinical is not my forte. I can mention that we have a couple of different, well, we have a whole division, SimSIP, uh, which is in the translational space using PBBK and quantitative systems pharmacology models uh, to potentially predict outcomes in humans based on animal and in vitro data. We also have another group uh, that, headed by Daryl Nix, which is in the early uh, development, drug development, where essentially we kind of start, uh, you know, again with the translational space, but taking us up through like IND or even, um, you know, early phase one. And so those folks are really uh, practiced in the art of, uh, you know, putting together a package that justifies, you know, first in human uh, approvals and also study designs. Someone wants to know, um, they say that they got a PhD in PPPK modeling. Is it possible to do that sort of uh, research at Sertara? Uh, definitely. Like I said, we have an entire division that that's their, their, their primary focus is physiologically based PK models. And so, and I, you know, so there's always opportunity for that. I will say that my, the quantitative sciences that I head up, that's not our core remit but there is a whole division de devoted to that. Awesome. Um, Mark, we talked a lot about your career path. What would you say would be a lesson learned that you, you gained along over the years? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think one of them I, is sort of a truism is what will limit your impact as a pharmacometrician is not your ability to analyze, but your ability to communicate. Um, and so that's, that's a big one. I, I'll say another one. Never burn a bridge, ever. Uh, this is not a large universe that we live in, so play nice and be not, you know, and be kind and not, uh, and and also humble because mm -hmm. <laughs> you never know someone that you have, uh, you know, maybe not treated nicely. They may yeah, be your colleague again or even your boss. So so be gener be gracious. Yeah, <laughs> being being nice. I I totally agree. It's always good to be nice, always important. Um, so someone was talking about our work in phase one, two, and three. Can you talk a little bit about how Sertara fits in um, that work with, with regulatory considerations? So we have a growing regulatory uh, strategy consultancy group. Uh, and so we, we can help our clients with those engagement strategies with the uh, regulatory agencies. We also have uh, established relationships with the FDA, EMA, and also the PMDA, and particularly the FDA, we have a, a CRADA, which is essentially uh, mainly around our software products where they, we make them available uh, free of charge and then they give us uh, feedback on how to further uh, develop and improve those um, platforms. Awesome. Well, Mark, we're getting, we're getting to the top of the half hour. It's, Thank you so much, so much for taking time out of your day to, to, to come talk with us. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I want to thank ASCPT for generously letting us do this micro recruitment session. Uh, I'm Suzanne Minton. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks, Suzanne. And thanks, thanks, ASCPT. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark and Suzanne. I want to thank our audience as well. A special shout out to Sertara just for uh, providing this session today. Uh, any questions you might have, again, go ahead and submit them to members at ASCPT.org, or you can connect directly with Suzanne or Mark on their LinkedIn profiles. Uh, otherwise, have a great day. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye.